All right. Looks like we are kicking it. Let's make sure that this feed is working. It is. It looks like we're we're here. And let me see how long. Oh, let's meet that. <laughs> it does look like it's a solid 30 seconds behind. But it's time to share. Time to do what we always do when we start a live broadcast, which is share things everywhere. Try to keep my eye on people popping in once they do. Um, I will. Uh, yeah, we got some folks coming in. Uh, as you come in, um, it would be lovely if you could uh, share, like, subscribe. Make sure that you get the get this out to some people so that this level of awkwardness does not need to last longer than you know one or two minutes. Uh, but uh, pardon me as I do what I always do. I'm, I, it's just me working all this stuff. Uh, so please uh, be patient. I appreciate your patience um, as I get the get the word out to let people know that we are we are live. We're going to be starting the, uh, the the discussions on our topics today um, in just a few minutes. Uh, so stay tuned, hang in there. And uh, like I said, if you could, what would be super awesome is if you hit that share, uh, hit the like, and let some folks know that we are live uh, and we are ready to ready to go. So just hang tight, folks. Just give me a few minutes. Uh, and if you don't want to hit that share button, if you feel like today's conversation is not something that you feel like you want to take part in, um, you know, that's okay. That's okay. Or if you don't want to hear me ramble while I'm sh while I'm doing all these shares, uh, you can leave the video up and go go grab a drink, go grab a coffee, uh, a little water, uh, some snacks, uh, whatever whatever you need to get through uh, the <laughs> the the ramblings of the your old pal Chris Mohan. Um, so yeah, let me share these out to one or two other groups. All right, I think that's all of the groups that I want to share this to. I'm going to post an event, invite a few folks, and then we'll be ready to go. Like I said, uh, it's just me doing this stuff. I don't, I don't have, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the funds or the luxury to um, hire anybody. Uh, to help me with this sort of stuff or else uh, or else I would but uh, I don't and uh, and that's just something that I think we're all gonna have to live with and be okay with forever uh, but <laughs> uh, you know as people come in to tune in let's see All right. Okay, we are almost ready, folks. Give me just a few minutes. I want to make sure that uh, I invite a few folks that I know pay attention to this stuff um, on a regular basis and participate in the comments. If you are not somebody that participates regularly in the comments, uh, you can become one. Uh, you can become a person that regularly participates in the comments by leaving a comment. Uh, I usually do a check-in at the top of the show. 
Um, so uh, I invite you to do your own check-in, and then we can take a look at the check-in uh, and uh, and and start the show that way on a on a positive note of what's going on um, and things of that sort. So uh, yeah, I, I I invite you to do that if you would like to, or you could just hang out and watch. That's t that's totally cool as well. Um, Right, I think they're at. I'm almost done, you guys. All right, I think that's everybody that is going to be interested in this and that watches this thing pretty regularly. Cool. All right, here we go. Hello. All right. Uh, so, as you guys know, um, when we do these live shows, uh, I will. Uh, I'll put up a little thing. Um, to kind of let you know that uh, that you, who commented on something, and then we'll usually get to that at the end of each segment, so that I don't lose my train of thought. It doesn't get totally random. Um, so let me put that comment up. See it at the end. So, uh, there you go. There's somebody leaving a comment. Hi, Tabitha. How are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, as per always, you can you can leave a donation, uh, become a sustaining member, so on and so forth, uh, over at the over at the old website. But let's begin. Uh, let's dive into this uh, this 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 today's episode. It's been a week since uh, I've been uh, I, I did these videos, and that is because I spent the I, I spent a good portion of the week um, getting ready for. Um, the uh, Zoom shows that I've been doing. This this yesterday I did uh, I did a special storytelling show uh, for the Pittsburgh Fringe. It was different than what the Citizen Revolution comedy show is going to be. Uh, the Citizen Revolution comedy show is a mix of traditional stand up, uh, video commentary, um, you know, historical anecdotes, uh, and and a little bit of storytelling here and there. Um, so the next one is on May eighth. May 8th. Uh, tickets are only five bucks. If you're a sustaining member, you get a free ticket. And uh, if times are tough, uh, you're in a precarious situation, you want to check out the show, you want to get some laughs in, uh, you know, please message me, email me, um, hit me on the back end, and I will uh, make sure that you get a ticket uh, to come check out the show. And it's very important that you guys get a ticket because that is how I'm going to be able to communicate. Uh, the login information for the Zoom to ensure that we don't get any sort of unwanted guests, because that is a thing that's happened um, in, uh, in in the Zoom the the Zoom world of of uh, virtual live stand up comedy. But yesterday was um, uh, the storytelling show that I did. I'll be putting up. Uh, um, I'll, I'll probably put up uh, clips of that. Uh, if you are a sustaining member and you missed the show, uh, I'm going to put it, put up an unlisted video of the whole performance. Um, and, uh, that'll be one of the, one of the patron exclusive gifts, uh, that you get. So there's some perks, uh, for, for becoming a sustaining member. If you, if you can, if not totally understandable. Um, so, uh, there's that. Hello, Dolores. Good to see you. Welcome back. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm excited. Uh, I feel a lot better. I, I was pretty stressed out, to be honest. This week was very stressful. I, I didn't sleep particularly well uh, a whole lot this week because I was just kind of working and and not. I'm very concerned about like what these shows are going to be. So I took the week off to kind of think about that and work on these shows itself. Uh, so I'm still in the process of of, of writing and creating um, graphics and video content and things of that sort. Uh, so these videos are going to happen this week. Uh, I will be doing a lot, of, like going back to the regular schedule of doing these videos every every day. Uh, but they'll probably be either be shorter or deal with one to do one to two stories, like we're doing today. Um, they'll be they'll be slightly less intensive, uh, so that I can have a little bit of time to uh, do the writing, do the work that I need to do for these shows, um, and also be able to get some rest and also be able to exercise because that is something I have not fucking done all week, and I it like I feel 
Like I feel very flabby and not great. Um, it's something that I've like started to get back into and uh, something that I feel uh, pretty good about. So I want to continue doing it. And uh, I have not been able to do it this week because I'm just, I, I, can't, I put myself in this stressful situation, right? Like I know I did that to myself and, uh, and, and I need to be better about that sort of stuff. But, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty excited. And if you're wondering like what uh, these Zoom stand-up comedy shows are going to look like, the Citizen Revolution comedy shows are going to look like, uh, there are clips uh, up on my Facebook page, as well as my YouTube channel, whatever, you know, your favorite way of watching content is, um, they're up on these these two platforms. So you can check them out. You can see what the format of the show is. Uh, like I said, tickets are only five bucks. They are in the description uh, of the episode. And I will, uh, I'll put it, I'll put a ticket link up. Uh, at the very end of the video, but if you if you look in the description, they are right underneath uh, what you know the the description of the episode. There, you guys know how descriptions work. I don't I don't need to over explain what descriptions are. Sometimes I feel like I need to do that, where I'm like, well, you know, like if you look at like there's like a title and then there's like a thing under like, and it's just like, what are you doing? You're being an idiot. Everybody knows what descriptions are. It's fine. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, other than that, I'm I'm doing pretty good. I want to say a huge thank you to um, to the folks that uh, that came out to the show uh, yesterday. Uh, we had a, a nice small little crowd, um, and it was good to see some familiar faces. And a uh, huge thank you to Shayla. Uh, she kicked ass. Uh, she, her, and Emily are, are like the main people that run Pittsburgh Fringe. Like it's basically like the two of them that put together an, a, a fucking huge fringe festival in Pittsburgh every single year. Um, and they, you know, in April, the festival got canceled and basically in a month's time, they had to figure out how to make this virtual festival work. Um, and they did. And, uh, and, uh, I, I was, uh, I was happy to be a part of, uh, that virtual festival. So thank you to everybody that showed up to that. Uh, thank you to everybody that's been buying tickets to the zoom show, by the way, to the citizen revolution comedy show. Uh, you guys are fucking awesome. Um, and I really appreciate, uh, you know, I really appreciate you guys doing that. That's, that's really cool of you guys to do. Uh, so, um, that's, that's basically the check in there. And I want to get into the two stories that I'm going to be doing. Uh, the second one is me, uh, kind of reading through an article with you guys and responding in real time. I've read most of it. I haven't read all of it. So, uh, let's dive into these stories. Now I will, um, give a little warning that this story is about the uh, sexual assault allegations that Tara Reid um, has uh, uh, put on Joe Biden, I think is the right way to say it. Uh, Joe Biden is basically being accused of sexually assaulting Tara Reid back in 1993, if you don't know the story. Um, so there are going to be some touchy themes throughout the story. Um, and uh, if if at any point things become uncomfortable or anything, feel free to tune out, take a break, and come back later. Totally cool, 100% understandable. Um, or, or, or if you don't want to come back because it got, it, 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 you know, I, I completely understand that um, as well. But I just wanted to, to you know, let let you know that that's since that's sort of the topic that we're talking about. I know uh, that can be kind of a, a touchier, a touchier subject. Uh, and, uh, let, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see where, where, where this goes. Um, so I want to start with the fact that let, like kind of a little bit of a recap of basically what happened. Uh, Tara Reid, who was a former, um, former staffer, uh, under Joe Biden, uh, has accused him of, uh, sexually assaulting her. I'm not going to go into the, the, the specific details because they are a little graphic, uh, but I encourage you guys to check out the Katie Halper interview that she did. Uh, Katie Halper is a fantastic progressive comedian and journalist. Uh, on the Katie Halper show, she did an interview uh, recounting the exact details of what happened. Uh, very good interview. Check that out. And um, she was on The Hill Rising with Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty. Also very good interview. And this came out uh, a little over a month ago like middle of March, it came out. Actually, when I started doing these daily videos, that was one of the first stories that I covered. Excuse me. Um, because it was kind of a big deal that this story came out. 
And, uh, and there was silence. There was silence from corporate media. There was silence from Biden campaign. There was silence from Biden himself. Um, and I mean, it blew up in the progressive circles, right? It super blew up in the progressive circles that this was that this was the story. Um, and then once people started kind of talking about it, they they levied a bunch of like, oh, this she's looking for attention. She's a Bernie supporter, so you know we can't trust these allegations. They're biased. Um, and these were all like this was like Alyssa Milano who is this like celebrity champion of the Me Too movement, the Believe All Women, you know, Kavanaugh is a rapist. We have to believe Christine Blasey Ford. Um, and then all of a sudden it comes to a Democrat getting sexual assault allegations thrown on them. And all of a sudden those same people are saying, no, we can't believe this lady. She's an opportunist. Um, you know, Joe Biden is great. He's a good guy. Look at, you know, he's great. He's a good dude. Uh, when, when you look at his record, you look at the way that he treated Anita Hill, uh, where it was a black woman, uh, you know, being grilled by a panel of older white male senators. Um, you know, the way that he kind of addressed that. You 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 look at uh, all of those uh, uncomfortable and inappropriate ways that he touches women. Um, you know, uh, that, that there are plenty of photos of all over the place. You look at the way that he just talks to people in general. He's a very, he's a very rude, um, arrogant, angry old man is kind of what he is. You know, you, you look at somebody that comes up and asks him a challenging question and he gets flustered very quickly. Uh, he gets angry very quickly. Um, there's, uh, you know, records of all of that. There's videos of all of this. <laughs> There's videos that surfaced during the campaign trail when somebody asked him about, about uh, what are we going to do about these pipelines? You know, like, are, are we going to pull back on fossil fuels? Which I think is a very reasonable question to ask. And he basically goes, you know what? I'm not the guy for you. Go vote for somebody else. When he was in, he, when he was part of the Senate Tr Judiciary Committee, uh, they talked to a UN uh, uh, weapons investigator during Iraq, and he treated this guy like total shit. He treats this guy like he's he's basically this like amateur noob that's coming out and being like, you know, just those people that are just like, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do this. Why? Well, we just shouldn't, right? Like he had a very, he had proof uh, that how America was dealing with Iraq, how America was dealing with um, this weapons of mass destru destruction allegations was not good. And Joe Biden treats this guy like he's an asshole. Like he talks down to him. He tells him that his opinion doesn't matter because he doesn't make enough money for his opinion to matter. These are all interviews that you can go check out. Like this is this is sort of who Joe Biden is, right? So I'm not a Joe Biden fan, but when I heard Tara's story, uh, I I believed it. I felt like it was a legitimate story that that I could believe. Uh, obviously, there needs to be an investigation done, um, and that is kind of what MSNBC is talking about. I'm also not a fan of MSNBC, right? Like if you've watched any of my shit, if you paid attention to anything that I've said for like the last five years, I am not a fan of corporate media. The three giant corporate news stations that are out there that are controlled by, by war profiteers, by the fossil fuel industry, that have these narratives that are these 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 monoliths of political theater than they are journalism. I don't like them, but they kind of did a fair job so far. I I will say. I mean, it took them what like a month and a half to get to this point. Um, you know, and and this is in the midst of people kind of freaking out on Tara Reid to be like, oh, she's a Putin puppet or whatever, because she took a Russian studies class and wrote fiction. Like, are you going to say that the people that wrote those movies where like the what if movies were like, what, ha what, what would have happened if Hitler would have won World War II? Or do you think those people are Nazis or do you think they're just like trying to take, do some creative storytelling? You know, like what if scenarios? Like, that's what she wrote. And they're like, bah, McCarthyism, let's do that again. Over fucking nothing. <laughs> so um, there were two journalists on MSNBC recently uh, that I watched um, over the course of the week that 
kind of made some pretty fair statements, in my opinion. Uh, Chris Hayes, Chris Hayes basically pointed out saying that, hey, uh, sometimes, you know, people that we like uh, do bad things. And we have to kind of accept that they are going to do bad things. And we have to investigate what those bad things are. And we have to talk about whether it's, it's right or wrong, right? We have to do the investigation. And he just points out all the details that we already know. <clears throat> he points out um, what Tara said. He points out that the campaign initially did said nothing. Uh, and then the campaign said that she was a liar. That's what the campaign came out and said. Uh, I think in like maybe sometime in April, like middle of April, they were basically like, this is all bullshit. What's your evidence that this is all bullshit? It just is. That's what the Biden campaign said. Joe Biden didn't say shit. He just kind of kept quiet. Um, you know, he did what he did when Hillary Clinton was speaking and fell asleep on it. Just didn't say a goddamn thing. All these accusations get levied. Uh, Tara Reid has a bunch of corroborations from her neighbor, her brother. Her mother has called into Larry King around the same time, which she said uh, happened. Uh, why didn't she come out earlier? Well, because she respected Joe. She liked Joe. She was a she was a, a lifelong Democrat. She believed in the party. She didn't want to make this guy look bad. Maybe this was, you know, maybe it was a misunderstanding. Maybe he'll apologize for it. Um, none of those fucking things happened, right? And Chris Hayes points out all this. That's all he did. And he, and he basically said, we have to look into this. We have to investigate this and we can't just say that this person is one way or the other because we like a candidate. So all the people, all these Biden bros that are out there that like Joe Biden, that claim that he's the lesser of two evils, whatever it is, whatever their reason for it is, um, that's nice. But at the end of the day, we have to be fair about this and we have to investigate into it. That's basically all Chris Hayes said. Which is like, yeah, that's okay. This is not like a like this is not like a crazy statement where he was just like, I I have the evidence. I am going to take on this case myself, right? Like, made a pretty reasonable statement, and everybody on Twitter said that they should fire Chris Hayes. Fucking crazy, right? All all because he said we should probably investigate Joe Biden. Now, to me, this is another example where innocent until proven guilty only applies to the rich and powerful only applies when you're in a position like Joe Biden, right? When, when you're enough of a tool for the oligarchs, when you're enough of a tool for the donor class or, uh, or, or you can be like a puppet for the fucking deep state that only applies to the rich. It never applies to, to us. Right. Like anytime, anytime you see an innocent black person get shot or killed by the police, there's a shit ton of people that come out and be like, well, you should have been doing something wrong in the first place. It's like, how do you know he was doing something wrong? Well, cops would have done that. Yeah, really? There's no record of cops just beating the shit out of people for no fucking reason. Really? Like there's that's never happened in the history of policing ever. <laughs> like. But it's his black or white thinking, right? Like, well, he's a Democrat. He's got to be a good guy. That's what Democrats are good people. That's why they're the blue. And then Republicans are evil. That's why they're the red, which is also the color of Satan. It's like, yeah, what, what was the, what's the old adage? The devil's greatest trick is to prove that he never existed in the first place. That's what they do. And in this case with Joe Biden, like it's not even innocent until proven guilty. It's innocent and you take my word for it and that's it. It's case closed and we're fucking done. Right? Joe Biden's campaign, not even Joe Biden himself. Joe Biden's campaign came out and said, no fucking way. And that's it. Case closed. We're done. It's done. Why are we even talking about this? Right? That's how, that's how the oligarchs want this. That's how corporations... That's how all, all, all of the donor class want this to be. That's how Alyssa Milano wants this to be. Alyssa Milano came out and said, Joe's innocent. What more do you want? What more do you want? The lady that played a witch on television for like nine years said, 
you know, the lady that played like a fictional character and I don't think has done much of anything since. <laughs> I might be wrong. I don't know. I don't know Alyssa Milano's personal career. I just know her from Charmed. They don't even want to attempt to prove that he's innocent in this situation. And anybody that even says that we should attempt to investigate and see whether he's guilty or innocent is they're like, fucking get rid of this guy. Get him out of there. So that was Chris Hayes. Um, and the second one was uh, Mika. I think it's Mika from Morning Joe. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce her name. I might be wrong. If 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 I am wrong, I'm, I apologize. I hate when people like don't pronounce names properly because my name gets pronounced weird all the time and I've just kind of gotten used to it. But I always like try my best to uh, pronounce people's names properly. So I think it's Mika. Um, She's uh, she's one of the uh, anchors on uh, Morning Joe, which uh, with Biden's declining mental state, uh, believes that it's a show kind of worshiping his record. Um, but she asked him a couple of very important questions. Now, the um, one of the one of the bigger things she brought up was Joe Biden's quote. Uh it's like during Dr. Ford's case, he came out and said, you know, it's important. Uh, believe women means that we believe the essence of what they're saying, right? So the essence of what Dr. Ford was saying is that Judge Kavanaugh raped her in the 80s. That was the essence of what she was saying. And he, and he basically said that we should believe the essence of that. The same thing is now being levied against Joe Biden. Tara Reid, the essence of what she's saying is that Joe Biden raped her in 1993. And Joe Biden is quoted to say that we should believe the essence of, but now he's like, no, but not this though. Like the essence of this is bullshit because it's about me. And you know, like Joe Biden's about to drop some bullshit whenever he, whenever he starts saying something, has a half second pause and goes, look, right? It's always just like, I, I, I said what I said. I, I know what I said. I, I think we should believe the look, you know, uh, when I said that I was in a state where uh, there were a lot of people. Uh, look, Mika, I want to let you know that the, that's when you know, like, it's going to be a bunch of like blathering bullshit because his brain doesn't know how to like come up with an answer to to the hypocrisy that he's being faced with. Believe the essence of what women say, except Tara Reid, who's a liar and uh, should not be believed about what she's saying about Biden, right? Like that's that's basically what Joe Biden is saying in this situation. And then he said there should be an investigation; people should look into it, and uh, that uh, you know the the New York Times and another credible news source, uh, uh, you know, they they did an investigation and uh, they found they found uh, no evidence, no evidence of this, right? Now, here's the thing. Um, New York Times is not as credible as you might think. They're kind of a bullshit paper. They're, they're a corporate oligarch paper is basically what they are. Uh, New York Times talked to a couple of his former staffers uh, who said that they don't remember Tara. They don't remember a complaint being filed or any of those stuff. But Tara, the New York Times didn't talk to Tara herself, her neighbors, her family, or any of the people that have come out and corroborated Tara Reid's story. And I have also personally witnessed the New York Times lying about a certain situation to fit their fucking narrative. I've witnessed it personally, right? So, come, uh, this was, holy crap, I'm trying to remember what year it was. 2018, maybe? 20, no, tw uh, 2017. Okay, this was about three years ago. I was opening for Lee Camp in New York City. The New York Times came out to do a story. Um, and so, you know, Lee basically said, like, uh, I only do live interviews because then it's a lot easier for the editors to kind of edit the story and make it sound like something it's not, which is something that people do. Right. Like if you want to take a certain spin, um, that's kind of the thing that they do. So he invited him to the show and then he was like, you know, I'll. I'll try to talk to you as long as I, as long as, you know, you guys don't edit 
the shit that I say. Uh, and so the dude comes. I met him. <laughs> he said hi. I took him to his his comp seat. Um, we started the show. There was like one guy during the show that was like super excited about Bernie that like got you know sort of yelling shit. And Lee just kind of was just like, "Hey man, we'll start the revolution after the show." But let me finish my show that everybody paid here you know, paid to come see. And then afterwards, we'll fucking start the revolution, right? Like he handled it very nicely. He didn't make the guy feel like a total dick. And then he kind of settled down. After the show, uh, at the same club, there was a Russian rapper that was booked to perform, right? It had nothing to do with the Lee Camp show. It, they, it just so happened that the late show was this Russian rapper. Uh, and this, uh, this writer lied about Lee handling the Bernie supporter uh, came out and said like Lee Lee made fun of the guy or something, which is not true. Um, and then he was like, out, so I, I tried to find Lee Camp, uh, but uh, but he just he just disappeared. I, I don't know where he went, which is like that's also not true. He announced that we were going to be up in the balcony selling merch, which is what we fucking do after every show. I handle the merch table. I walk up and down the fucking aisle, ask people what they want, take their money. Like I, I handle all that shit. Like I was up there. There was like 120 people that were trying to get merch from Lee Camp. Now we're trying to get a photo, shake his hand, right? So this like one fucking reporter couldn't wait the 45 to an hour that it actually takes us to run through all that many people to ask Lee Camp some questions. And then he goes outside and he's like, and then I heard some big burly men. Hmm, Russia right like that's basically what they did when it was like there's a fucking rapper there's a russian rapper that came out all you had to do was ask who the next act was that this is their reporting that the new york times does they don't actually do reporting they do propaganda that's what they fucking do so the new york times is not a credible goddamn source they also fired Chris Hedges. They fired Chris Hedges because he was doing his job as a journalist too well. He was covering the Iraq war in an accurate way, and they fucking fired him. This is who the New York Times is. This is who Joe Biden is saying is a credible news source. Whew. I'm going to take, take a minute to breathe. The New York Times is not an actual newspaper. They're, they're the mouthpiece of the oligarchs. They're a propaganda machine. And, the, and this is what is exonerating Joe Biden, according to Joe himself. Now, plus, uh, Biden says he doesn't remember Tara. He doesn't remember any complaints being thrown against him. And if there was a complaint, there'd be a record of it. Um, and uh, because he can't remember Tara, then, you know, then it probably didn't happen. Yeah, the guy that's, that clearly has dementia can't remember something, and we're supposed to take him on his word. That's the best excuse that Joe Biden has right now to prove his innocence. Joe Biden can't remember what he had for dinner yesterday. And he's like, well, you know, I don't remember. Case closed. I feel like that's all the evidence that we need. Are we done, Mika? Can we get out? How do we turn off these lights? Is there a way? Do I clap? Is it a clap situation? Now, he talks about these records, um, which uh, exist in... in um, basically, they're being held by the University of Delaware. And the University of Delaware is refusing to release these records until Joe Biden is out of public office. And there's a couple different ways you can get around that, right? Um, and, and Mika points this out. She was like, why don't you do a word search in these records to see if Tara's name would point would come up? And Joe's like, what? What are you fucking talking? Word search? That's crazy. Can we do that? Is that a thing? Can you actually search for words? How do you do that? How do you search? Do we have this kind of technology? How, how are we doing this? And it's such bullshit because there's so much hypocrisy in all the shit that he says, right? Because then he calls for transparency. He's like, yes, I believe that everything should be transparent. We should be as open about this investigation as we possibly can. This should be a transparent investigation. We should release, but, but we can't 
we can't release those records. We cannot, those records are within the, and it's within the University of Delaware. Maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's not something with the Senate, uh, but we can't release those. What, what, why, why can't we release? Because there might be things in there that I said that, that might not be favorable to me. I might have said certain things that are not very nice uh, and uh, kind of go against the people that I'm lying to on a constant basis. And then when those lies get exposed and I'm running for president, that's not going to look good. That's literally what he said. He was like, oh, so things can be taken out of context. You know, I met with Putin. Oh, he's a Putin puppet. He met with Putin when he was the VP. He's a puppet. He is a puppet. It's just like, really? Like, things are getting taken out of context and you can't provide the full context? Of course he can't. He's doing an abysmal job of fucking uh, defending himself on, an, on MSNBC, which is basically like the DNC fucking mouthpiece. <laughs> yeah, let's look at what your record has. If, if, it's, if it's as fucking terrible as all the shit that's already out there, where your crime bill that put more black people in prison, or the fact that you voted for an unnecessary illegal war, or that you treated Anita Hill like shit, or that you literally said that you would refuse Medicare for all in the face of a global pandemic, that you, that you are for bailing out the banks than you are for helping working class people. And Nancy Pelosi comes out and she's like, no, she, he understands to play... Of, of poverty you know his his dad lost his job he was poor for a while you know he understands he understands what that's what that's like and that's why he's bailing out the banks that's why he suckles at the teats of the plutocracy anytime somebody brings up these records and why nobody is trying to get these records out and making them public to prove that Biden is innocent. And by the way, they're also just like, if Tara's name is not in these records, then that's proof enough, right? Which that, but that, that doesn't prove anything. That, that means that somebody could have um, not filed the records properly. Uh, she was moved to some like arbitrary office at one point um, that there's like virtually no record of uh, just to like get her away from people. They might've not filed her complaint you know, there's a lot of different things that could go wrong. That's why it need, there needs to be like a legitimate investigation, not just, well, New York Times and the Washington Post talked to a guy we think had something to, he had lunch with Joe Biden in 93 at one point, And he said, Joe's great. He ordered the tuna fish. That's, I feel, uh, rapists don't order tuna fish. You know, that's a fact. I think everybody knows that. How do we know that? Oh, because it's in the New York Times. Every time that these records are brought up, every single Democrat, every single Democrat that's been talked that that talks to um, any sort of corporate news outlet freaks the fuck out. Nancy Pelosi freaked out. Stacey Abrams freaked out. Joe Biden is even freaking out. Like he's losing his shit in the middle of this interview. They just get angry and pouty, and then they they're just like Trump. And we got to beat Trump. We got to beat this guy so you can't you can't bring up credible allegations against somebody that we think should be Trump. Everybody goes, well, why did it take so long for her to to come out? This happened in 93. Well, look at how we're treating her now. Right. When Joe Biden, there's there, there's a large contingent of people uh, that kind of don't like Joe Biden right now, <clears throat> that don't believe that Joe Biden is the right candidate. I'm one of them. I don't like Joe Biden. I'm not a big fan of the guy. Right. And his popularity is a lot lower than it was in 93. And look at how we're treating her now. Had she done that in 93 when his popularity was a little bit higher, when people actually liked Joe Biden a little bit more and thought he was a good guy and a fair and impartial person? she would have been fucking destroyed. There would be like virtually no, no chance for her. She would have probably become a pariah like Monica Lewinsky was when, when Clinton was happening. 
And look at the way that Biden even treats these allegations, even like the smaller ones, right? The ones where um, it's, uh, hey, you lingered on a hug, you sniffed my hair, and you held me too, way too close up against you. And he didn't even apologize. He literally came out and was just like, things change. I like to touch people. And all of a sudden, they're telling me I can't touch people with that way. I just, I just want to hold on to people. You know, I just got to hold them to let them know that I love them and I will control them because I love them. And that's great. I don't even think this is like he never said sorry. He was just like, things are different now. Never. I'm sorry I made anybody feel uncomfortable. That's not the goal that I had. If I did, I'm, you know, I, I didn't see my actions properly. This is the best option that the DNC can throw out at us. And they crucify people that are like, hey, we should take these allegations seriously and do like real investigation, like real investigation to this. And they're calling to have people that call that out fired. <laughs> this might not be a popular opinion, um, but I feel like it's an important opinion to, to state. And I think it, I think it, you know, a lot more of us need to, to understand this is America is in the shape that we're in because we constantly are ready to vote for the lesser evil and constantly doing it over and over again. Right. We, we justify voting for evil all the time. We're just ready to give up our belief systems and vote for the lesser evil all the time. That's why we're in the shape that we're in. We make these concessions all the time. This is what people do whenever this vote for your vote for the lesser evil argument. This is what people do with their belief system. They go like this. That was your belief systems. You just crumple it up and you fucking throw it away. This the shape of this country is where it is because we keep compromising our own belief systems so that the rich don't so that people like Joe Biden don't they're not held accountable for their shit they're not even remotely close to being held accountable for their shit we're, we're supposed to back <laughs> our, the shape of this country is the way that it is because the Democratic Party is asking us to back the lesser of two alleged rapists and i guess it's quantity over quality right joe didn't joe didn't do this to to multiple people so he's better and then we wonder boy why are corporations taking over all of the things all of our basic needs boy what are we why are we profit why are we adding a profit margin to human life it's because we back people like this even chomsky is doing it Chomsky's been talking about voting for the lesser evil for the better part of two decades. And I like Noam Chomsky. I'm a, I'm a Noam Chomsky fan. I think he's on point with manufacturing consent. I think he's on point with the way that he talks about corporatism, right? But he's not on point when he talks about voting for the lesser of two evils. I disagree with him. I think that's a bad idea. If this election is as important as what people say it is, then why is voting for evil the solution? Why is voting for evil always the solution? Every election is the most important election we've ever seen in our entire lives. And we have to compromise what we believe in. We have to compromise our ethics. We have to compromise our basic needs. Just so the lesser can get in. How about we vote for good? How about we find what we believe in? How about we find the ideas that we're willing to support? And we support the people that believe in those ideas. And, and move forward that way. Because at this point, they don't have any reason not to make any compromises on their own behalf. To come out and give you some fucking lip service like Joe Biden does. Right? Oh, I, I b believe all women. Okay. Well, there's this lady that's saying that she's, that you sexually assaulted her. Except her. Don't believe her. All women but the ones that say anything against me. And everybody just goes, well, that's, that seems right. The more we keep doing that, the more they are going to compromise what we need and take more away from us. 
who are we compromising for? We're compromising for the elites. We're compromising for the corporate oligarchy. That's what we're compromising. That's what we've been compromising for. Republicans and Democrats together have been compromising that shit. Maybe we stop. Maybe we don't do that anymore. All right, let's see what you guys have to say. John Sheehan. John Sheehan's watching. Uh, if I'm a heavy metal fan, do I have to become a red Republican now? I think you do. I think you do. Because that is the color of the devil. Heavy metal is the soundtrack of the devil. Uh, and I don't think you have an option, John. I think you are you are now a card-carrying, uh, double-neck guitar-wearing uh, Republican. Because we all know Republicans love that double-neck guitar. Big fans of those double-neck guitars. Uh, and sweet, sweet solos. Sweet, sweet solos. Uh, and really, if we know something about the, the Republicans, big fans of the devil. Big, big fans of the devil. <laughs> All right. We're going to move to our next thing. So we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to read this article that, that a couple people have been posting. I read through some of it. I haven't read through all of it. Um, so there is a uh, disclosure, uh, about that. Um, I haven't read through all of it, but we're going to read it together. So I hope you guys are, are, are cool with that. So we'll, we'll read through it. I'll do a couple responses. It's somewhat lengthy and I'll do my best uh, at reading. I'm not here. This is another disclaimer at the top too. Uh, I'm not the best reader in the world. Um, I always used to get embarrassed when I was in, uh, in middle school about reading, um, I, I would, I would always, that, that's sort of my, uh, Achilles heel, if you will, is reading out loud. So I'm, I'm being very vulnerable by doing this, you guys, uh, it's a super vulnerable moment for your, for your boy, Chris Mohan. So, uh, let's see, let's make sure I'm doing this right. There we go. Okay. So this is on Cora. It's an article titled, can you guys see this? Uh, yeah. Okay. It's showing up. Um, what liberals don't realize. That's the title of the article. What most, what most liberals, what don't most liberals realize? See, I told you, I'm fucking it up already. <laughs> what don't most liberals realize? Uh, it's by this guy named Peter Kruger. Um, he's at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. And uh, this, is a, this is from a couple, about a month ago. He wrote this, right? Um, Cora is, I guess, like a website where you can kind of sign sign in and, and write these essays like this. Um, sometimes they're on point. Other times they're not. Uh, but I like them. I think they're cool. Uh, I found some value in, um, in them. So let's begin reading. So he uh, starts the article. I'm in a bit of a unique position to answer this, I suppose, as I also note in my companion answer to the corresponding conservative question. I'm a never Trumper and I believe in careful, measured, restrained, deliberate progress. My more liberal friends are convinced I'm a conservative, but most conservatives seem convinced I'm somewhere left of Karl Marx. Here's the thing, the Overton window of this country has moved way far over to the right. Like even the Democrats are legislating for like more right-wing ideas than they are left-wing ideas, right? Like you really have to twist their arm. Like even Nancy Pelosi is like, like there was a story that came out saying that Nancy Pelosi was going to um, look into universal basic income. And she said, I never said that. I don't want to say that. I said, maybe some kind of a paycheck protection, something. Um, and she, and you know, like they're still not advocating for this universal basic income because it will fundamentally shift what it means to be a Democrat in this country. Anyway, let's keep reading. Uh, I grew up a short distance away from the birthplace of the Republican Party, which was a liberal and highly progressive party when it was created, I might point out. I had immediate family in the Grange, uh, a progressive Republican organization of farmers for most of its history. I was probably in college before I, I met a Democrat, right? And he's right. Uh, Lincoln was the first Republican president, very progressive uh, president by, uh, by, by all means of it. Uh, so we'll keep reading. By the time I was old enough to be aware of pol politics, 
Most people around me listen to WTMJ. Not sure what that is. Uh, Charlie Sykes. I, I do know that name. And Republicanism had turned uh, conservative and reactionary. The Tea Party was highly active and successful in my hometown and school district. My county broke 60-30 for Trump. How did an era of La Follette progressive farmers barely 100 years ago become what it is today? I've talked about this idea too. Um, if you remember, uh, I don't know if, you, if, if anybody checked it out or not, but I, I talked about Blair Mountain um, in West Virginia being this hotbed for these progressive socialist worker-based ideas, right? This, this battle for, for um, unions and the working class. And that was in 1921. And then we move forward to almost 100 years from now, even in less than 100 years, for the last like 30 years, West Virginia has seen these like cousin fucking hicks, these toothless assholes, right? And how did that happen? How did we go from the bastion of fighting for worker rights against the against corporatism against this like this 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 corporate slavery to calling these people hicks and uneducated and stuff like that so he goes on he's he's gonna he talks about these farmers these progressive farmers right uh progressivism started failing them them specifically and this enlarge what i think liberals have tended to fail to consider I understand that I'm likely to be a bit stereotypical here in lumping liberals in with city people. The, there are liberals in rural areas, sure. Most of them have a, already realized a lot of what I'm writing. And this is where I tour. So I, I've kind of seen this. I, a lot of people give me shit for the places that I tour, right? I tour a lot down south. I tour a lot in the Midwest. Um, and these, are, these tend to be more rural areas. And those are the areas where... People come out and they might be considered conservative or they might be considered libertarian or what have you, but they enjoy what I'm saying. They believe in what I'm saying. They agree with me for the most part. And whatever disagreements we have, we're able to sit down and over a beer and talk about it. Whereas in places like Asheville, North Carolina or Portland, Oregon, or even San Francisco, which have become these faux progressive neoliberal cities uh, where, you know, as long as they say nice things and say, we support gay people, but then fund the the, the, the anti-gay kind of candidate because they look good and whatever, right? These neoliberal, like, let's profit belief systems kind of thing. Whenever I go to those cities, I get I take a lot of shit for what I'm saying, for, for standing with the working class, for saying that we shouldn't uh, support the oligarchy, we shouldn't support Joe Biden. <laughs> uh, so uh, where are we at? Okay, for the most part, most outspoken liberals are not rural folks. The ones that dominate the Democratic Party are typically from urban areas. This is, as I have looked into the history of things, an artifact of the 20th century. There were formerly progressive wings in both major parties, but into the 20th century, the Republican Party tended to move more and more rural rather than just north. Republicans had always tended to be more pro-capital, through the late 19th century, while labor was more a democratic plank. The, there was a pro-labor progressive movement for a brief time that really held sway over the Republican Party leaders with uh, Republican Party with leaders such as Theodore Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, Robert Feitenbaum La Follet, and William Howard Taft. All of that is almost true. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, I will say, did try to pull away from the profitization of the Republican Party itself because he went up against Taft and Taft went straight to the delegates because he was like, none of these fucking mooks are fucking making the decisions. The delegates are picking the candidate for the party. So I'm going to circumvent all of this nonsense and go directly to the delegates. Teddy Roosevelt saw that was happening felt that it was bullshit and created the Bull Moose Party. I've talked about the Bull Moose Party. I'm writing about the Bull Moose Party. Um, and that was a progressive wing. It was an anti-corporate populist party uh, in the early 1900s. So this is almost accurate. Taft wasn't really um, part of that progressive wing. Teddy Roosevelt lost. He got 20% of the votes, but he lost. Um, and uh, and then the Bull Moose Party kind of dissolved, and most of them went back to being 
Republicans anyway. So maybe that's where he's assessing that information from. I don't know. Uh, rural organizations like the Grange were the most progressive pro-labor force in agricultural regions like the Midwest, kind of like the, um, the coal workers union was in uh, West Virginia. As the Republican Party lost its progressive wing in the early 20th, early 20th century into intra-party fighting between the more measured Roosevelt progressives and the more radical left or late Republicans, the conservative pro-capital wing regained control of the party with leadership such as Warren Harding and Herbert Hoover. Uh, I have to look into La Follette. Maybe that'll be something that I talk about later this week. Um, now, Woodrow Wilson solidified a pro-labor progressive contingent within the Democratic Party when the Republican coalition fell apart in 1912. Uh, uh, bullshit, actually. That is super false. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was a neoliberal capitalist, <laughs> a pro-war neoliberal capitalist. Woodrow Wilson is the reason why we have the Espionage Act. Woodrow Wilson is the reason why we don't trust whistleblowers. Woodrow Wilson is the reason why Julian Assange is still in fucking prison for revealing the truth about American war crimes and corporate fraud on a global scale. Woodrow Wilson went up against a, a true pro-worker pro-labor candidate named Eugene V. Debs, who ran on the Socialist Party of America. Woodrow Wilson was not a fucking progressive. Woodrow Wilson is what the mainstream Democratic Party actually fucking is. So I got to disagree uh, with, with, the, with the author here, with Peter here, uh, because that is uh, super wrong. Okay, this was primarily aimed at unionization, which in turn uh, tended to be more heavily favored uh, in the increased industrialization and urbanization of the country. By the time that Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt was elected to office, Republicans were increasingly becoming the party of the rural areas and the Northeast, and the Democrats were increasingly becoming the party of the cities. That might be true. I'm, 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 I'm not super familiar with the, with, with the history of kind of that split that happened. Um, it might have happened during FDR. It might have happened a little after FDR. Um, so... Uh, uh, I'm not particularly sure, but I do think that the Democratic Party was not about unionization um, until FDR came into power. Uh, Wilson actively fought against any sort of unionization. He called it Bolshevism. He used McCarthyist tactics before they were McCarthyist. We should really call it Wilsonist uh, if, uh, if, 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 if we're being totally accurate about it. Uh, Woodrow Wilson put out, the, I mean, the Espionage Act is kind of the lead in to McCarthyist principles. Okay, uh, that split was torn open by the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and other progressive reforms of the late 1960s. The conservative Dixiecrats of the rural South finally abandoned party loyalty for ideological loyalty and switched sides when conservative leadership within the Republican Party worked out a deal to provide them with continued seniority, starting with Strom Thurmond. Joe Biden's really good friend. <laughs> Joe Biden worked with Strom Thurmond <laughs> and, and supported like segregation. <laughs> so um, this urban rural divide, he was a Dixiecrat. This urban rural divide had continued to accelerate to today, evident in this electoral map, uh, such as these from the 2016 election. I don't know how many of you guys can see this. Um, you, you, you might be able to see it a little bit more clearly on your screen. I'm not entirely sure, uh, but uh, that's a lot of red folks. Uh, and this is, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of where I tour, to be honest, right? Like the middle of this country, uh, I was, I, I went deep south. Uh, I went from Alabama uh, into te into the the Arkansas area, into Tennessee, into Texas, Louisiana, and up into the Midwest around Chicago, and then came home. That was my last tour. That whole big swath of fucking red. That's where I tour. That's that's my bread and butter, you guys. Fucking red states. In 2016, I was in these areas, by the way, most of them. Uh, this is adjusted for population, and this is a, an election map. I'm not really sure exactly what this map is. And this map seems very weird. Uh, it's a 3D map. I guess it's showing you where, where there's a Democratic and 
Republican presence. Uh, I don't bring this up to get into a debate about the electoral college, only to point out urban rural divide. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so one, the, it's an ideology. Uh, uh, it's not an ideology or even a partisanship. It's about rural consciousness. Okay, if you haven't read Captain Kramer's outstanding work in uh, the politics of resentment, I haven't. I, you really, really should. I probably will. Uh, <laughs> as I read it, I was stunned at how well she described my hometown and the people in it. Uh, I don't know if one of the test groups she had was actually in my town, but it might as well have been. It was eerily familiar. You know, I remember reading an article in uh, in in 2016 before the election about how uh, the more rural areas of, uh, and this might be, she might be the author of it because I can't remember the author of it, but it basically talked about how these like rural farmers in uh, like northern Wisconsin were kind of resentful of Madison and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, because all the rules were made in regards to what farmers in that little area wanted. Um, and she said like it, these guys basically said that they don't feel represented. They don't feel heard, um, which is why they're they were more likely to vote for Trump because they feel like Trump. Um, you know, uh, listen to them. So maybe that's kind of the same thing. I, I'm, I'm going to have to check that out and revisit it if that is the same thing. Because I remember reading it going, yeah, this fucking explains a whole lot of shit. It explains all of the things I'm hearing while I'm on tour. Okay, Kramer discovered that rural people very much have their own social identity and they feel that it's, it, it is both under attack and worthy of preservation and that it is not justified. The politics are dominated by the increasingly concentrated population of urban areas. Without geographical representation like the Electoral College or what liberals point out is an unfair weight uh, of the rural vote, there is a fear, one that is often realized that city folk will simply come in, invade them, and impose their city-minded views on them. So interesting because this sounds like rural gentrification, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like rural gentrification. <laughs> it's what poor people get scared whenever, like the you know, like the like the the richy rich move into the area. You know, like those yuppies move in because uh, they got a job at the tech company and they're making like 125k starting and they're like we just brought this home and we're going to renovate it and do all these things to it and everybody else in the neighborhood that's like oh god are you going to increase the property value and fuck me out of my house like it kind of sounds like that <laughs> when you hear rural people wanting deregulation and complain about overreach they're just latching on to terms that describe what they experience I can't tell you how many farmers or rural county executives I know that are pissed to hell at the state because it seems like every year there is some new un unfunded mandate or regulation or tax law. There may be and usually a very good reasons for these things, but they aren't explained to my people. It's just another uh, edict from Madison and Milwaukee. I, so it sounds like it is the thing that I read. Um, they have a lower tax basis and lower economies of scale because of the lack of population density. Progressive policies often fail to take into account uh, and raise revenue by raising statewide property taxes. This massively disproportionate hits massively di disproportionately hits rural people who tend to be land rich and money poor. Land is a great asset, but it is not a liquid one. So when we're barely breaking even most years, and two shitty seasons away from complete insolvency and China and California and giant agri-corps are dumping cheap milk and pork into the system, uh, we're kind of fucked when you start demanding another thousand bucks a year from us. That's a fair concern. That's a fair concern. Um, you know, and, and because, they're, because they are land rich, if you increase property taxes on them without saying why you're increasing property taxes on them. I mean, you could do the same thing for companies like Monsanto, for, for Chinese-based companies, right? Um, and that's what a lot of other companies do is they buy up property. In fact, that's kind of the thing that we're seeing now is based on how things are going, based on the debt market that's being created 
uh, because of back rent, back mortgages and things like that, um, we're going to see property getting seized up by wealthy people, by other countries. The parking meters in Chicago are owned by Dubai. They just bought up the property where the parking meters are. So, like, you're not helping the city of Chicago when you pay a parking meter. You're helping Dubai. This is, like, very typical of what happens. Companies come in, they buy land, and then those companies get nationalized in a different country. And then now that country owns a piece of land in America because it's a corporate loophole because the public sector and the private sector are interconnected and owned by the same shit. It's a very, like, serious fucking thing. <laughs> Okay, so Minnesota is trying something that might help in the form of a tax credit for agricultural land when school districts want to pass a referendum so that farmers that are disproportionately impacted by property tax hikes don't get hit as hard. This is a good idea and a way to help show that progressive policies don't have to end up breaking them. Cool. This should be looked into and tried to be applied. This is something I, I'll, I'll probably look into to try to understand it. Uh, <laughs> number two, liberals can be pretentious as fuck sometimes. Yes, uh, he he has a a a a, a little dialogue from uh, from Firefly. Great show, um, big fan of that show. Uh, it is my people consider liberals to be smug elitists that look down on them, and both sides are not unjustified. Look at what you see. Uh, TV representing representing my people. The positive end of the stick is that uh, the naivete of Parks and Rec. Uh, what do we more commonly see ourselves portrayed as? Called on national television: rednecks, inbred hicks, toothless hillbillies, racists, and homophobes clinging to their guns and Bibles. Yeah, I know. If you take Obama's entire quote in context, it's speaking precisely to this problem. But the soundbite was all my people heard. And I mentioned this a few minutes ago. Is yeah, this is exactly what I'm kind of baffled by because when I go down South, when I go into the Midwest, when I go into these rural areas, I meet more progressive people, people that you wouldn't think are traditionally progressive. Stuart Huff and I were in Kalamazoo a few years ago, and I know I've told this story uh, probably at some point in this, in, in some video, but we saw a guy at our show wearing a shirt that says, you can pry my gun from my cold dead hands. And we were like, well, this guy's out. He's probably going to say some shit in the middle of the show. He fucking loved us. He loved it. And he came up and talked to Stuart, bought five of his CDs and two of mine uh, because he ran out of cash. And then, uh, and then he basically said, I live in the country. I live 40 minutes outside of Kalamazoo and I need my guns to protect myself from like animals that come on my property. And I also have like a quarter mile driveway. So people don't show up unless I invite them or I know they're coming over. So yeah, I got to be a little bit protective, but I don't think everybody should just own them willy nilly. You should have a reason for owning them and you should know what you're doing with. Like he was pretty reasonably minded and we made a, we made a judgment call and we were the assholes in that situation. Uh, look, this is this isn't entirely your fault, liberals. I grew up with the uh, with Jew jokes and black jokes and rampant homophobia. Uh, a family member who was a coach once yelled to one of his kids, "Run like a Mexican with a TV on his shoulder." I'm not kidding; it's that bad. Fuck, that's crazy. <laughs> oh my God. That's so wild. You know what's funny? Um, I've heard crazy, you know, stereotypical racist jokes like that from both sides. I literally had a Democrat come up to me. Um, she walked up and she said, it's so great that you're doing your show. The show was called How Not to Fit In. It's one of like the earliest albums I put out back in 2016 or something. And uh, the whole show is about like how I don't fit into both American culture and, um, you know, Indian culture, right? I don't fit into either of them. And I talk about that and she, and she was like, I'm so excited. You know, you don't see a lot of Indian comics, blah, blah, blah. Super excited about it. I thought she was going to love the show. And she came up to me after the show and she goes, you know, it would have been really nice if you, uh, if you did the accent a little bit. If you spoke with the accent, it would be really nice. 
Uh, I think that would be really, uh, it would enhance the act. Also, you know, what happened to all the stereotypes? Like she literally said, what happened to all the stereotypes? How come I didn't hear any jokes about 7-Eleven? How come I didn't hear any jokes about, and I've had this conversation with conservative club owners that have told me I need 7-Eleven jokes with liberal club owners that said I need 7-Eleven jokes. <laughs> like this sort of shit happens all the time. All right. Uh, I don't want to make any excuses for that, but here's why context matters. We didn't have any of those people in our community with the exception of homosexual people, though we certainly didn't know any of those. Homosexuality was one of those things that was pointedly ignored. I had a great aunt and uncle who uh, lived with a friend all my life. <laughs> my family still won't acknowledge the truth of it. Uh, yeah, you know what show kind of really did a great job of addressing that? was New Girl. Schmidt wouldn't accept that his mom was a lesbian for like a good like three seasons. And they kind of very subtly uh, addressed it and, and like pulled Schmidt out of it. Like it was it was really well done. Uh, but yeah, they're right. Uh, I was I was the minority kid in my school for a while. Like there weren't weren't a lot of black kids in my school. There weren't a lot of Mexican kids like I was diversity in my school for a little while um, that changed. Fortunately, uh, that changed. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I completely understand that. And that's part of the reason why, you know, when you look at media and there isn't proper representation and isn't just a stereotypical representation, like people look at the media and they think that I'm that fucking Indian kid from the Big Bang Theory where they're just like, oh, you probably are scared of girls and can't talk to them when they're around. It's amazing that you go up on stage with women in the audience and say words out loud into a microphone. And it's just like, great, okay, thanks, fucking CBS, right? Like, that's kind of what people think because they've never met an Indian person before or they never met a Mexican person. So they see these stereotypes. It's part of the reason why I stopped doing stereotype jokes in my act or if I did them, I subverted them. I flip them. I satirize them. Um, it's why I don't straight up just fucking do stereotypes. Uh, and I lost my place. Sorry. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> I've tried to explain it to my people. Uh, most of them won't listen. You can look at the comments I receive from certain people when I've written about white privilege as exhibit A. I, I get basically the same trying uh, to explain... Explain it to people back home. When I used to try to explain it to them, I was considering one of them smug, pretentious elitists who got a degree and thinks I'm better than them now. It took time for me to learn how to have those conversations in a way that helped me realize uh, the real harm those things cause. Yeah, and that's super difficult because I have dated a lot of uh, a lot of girls. Like my ex-wife's family was pretty conservative, um, and I'm basically like a hippie, lefty socialist. Right. Um, you know, where I'm like, fucking work a revolution. Let's do this shit. And they're like, we need our Bibles. Uh, and I would sit down and the first thing I would do is listen to them. Tell me what's up. And then we would talk about it. And I would go, you know, uh, I hear what you're saying and I can totally see where that's coming from. Have you thought about this? Here's a piece of information that perhaps you haven't heard. And that's a lot of what I got is, boy, I never thought about it that way. Oh, I hadn't heard that before. Um, but that's because I sat down and just listened to them. And it took me fucking years to figure that shit out. Yeah, like I went through my early 20s just snapping at people like that and getting nothing out of it. it took me years. It's super difficult. It's very hard. And you need like, I don't know, a million pounds of patience to get through that. And if you don't do it consistently, they tend to kind of slip back to, uh, you know, to, to, to their homeostasis of, you know, run like a Mexican holding a TV or whatever the fuck that quote was. Um, they go back to that because that's their, that's, that's the homeostasis. That's the origin point. And if you don't keep pulling them, you know, you're never going to shift that homeostasis over to a more uh, progressive side. It's the same thing goes with politics. If we don't push our politicians to take a more progressive stance, then that Overton window is never going to shift on a political level. Okay. Um, 
what most liberals tend to fail uh, tend to fail to realize is that it's a lack of experience with those groups of people. Liberals tend to make moral judgments about these people uh, because of these things. These people, in their view, we must believe uh, these things because they are terrible, immoral people. They believe uh, that these people must be irredeemable because who doesn't know uh, that such things are wrong today? I have a whole story about this on my album, Empathy on Sale, which is available for free uh, on my banking. Uh, it's the Uncle Marv story. If you've if you've seen me do stand up in the last couple of years, you've heard the Uncle Marv story. It's one of my favorite stories. It's a super important story. Uh, it's what got uh, somebody to threaten to decapitate me at one point. So it's a good story, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, that's not it. It's a real lack of realness to them. The only place that most of these minority communities exist to them is on television which is never set where they are. It's set in cities far away from them. They don't see that their reality represented to them with any fairness. My family had to learn the hard way why black jokes aren't cool after my sister married a black man from Chicago. They just don't know. You understand, like, to my ex-wife's family, like, I was the first, like, immigrant Indian kid that they ever met. So I sat down and just had a conversation with them and kind of had to be like, okay, you're going to make this weird fucking joke but it's because you've just like never fucking really met an Indian. Like you, the only Indian person you know is a doctor. That's why you make doctor jokes all the time. <laughs> like that's, that's part of the thing, right? <laughs> uh, it was suddenly real to them. An increasing Hispanic population in my home area working a lot of the dairy jobs has been creating an interesting split. The people who interact with them constantly, like the dairy farms that hire them, have done a 180 on Mexican jokes and anti-Hispanic rhetoric. People who don't interact with that community regularly are set in their old ways, and it's causing a lot of friction. Not just between the Hispanic community and the bigoted population, but between the two white communities. My people are welcoming to the people they actually know. When something happens, we all pitch into the fundraiser and grab their chain chainsaws to get a tree off of somebody's house after a bad storm. Doesn't matter who you are and what you look like or what your sexual orientation or non-binary gender is. This is the most dangerous thing to the oligarchs. Fred Hampton, who was, who was one of the most influential Black Panther leaders, was 23. Uh, he started out in the, in the Panther Party when he was about 20 and became a very prolific community organizer and leader in Chicago, was fucking murdered by the Chicago police and the FBI because he talked to white rural people. And he was bringing them into the coalition and starting a movement within... Black people and white people and Hispanic people and Chinese people and everybody was coming together. And that was scary because J. Edgar Hoover was a paranoid old white man that believed that the black messiah was coming to start a race war because him and Charlie Manson are basically the same fucking person. And then Fred Hampton, because he was starting a movement, was fucking murdered. This is the scariest thing to the deep state, to the intelligence community, to the corporate oligarchs, that all of the workers look beyond their identities, there's no longer that split, and they fucking attack you. That's what they do. That's how they fucking operate. This is the most dangerous fucking thing. Once you see outside this worldview, once you see outside this individualistic mindset of this ego-driven American exceptionalism bullshit and start cooperating with each other where it doesn't matter what your identity or sexuality is, where you're just people and you can get along and learn and understand and, and, and work together for common good causes, that's the scariest fucking thing. And you'll see them use their propaganda machines like the New York Times or MSNBC or CNN or Fox News. And they'll spin it so that people start dividing themselves up again. <sighs> Where do they? Okay. <laughs> Keep losing my place. I'm sorry. Okay, but this isn't reported. This isn't what makes it into the portrayals of my people on television. Nobody makes a national broadcast over aerial television uh, show out of rural Wisconsin that depicts the positives of rural life as it is. Even on cable, every show I've ever watched doesn't honor the rural consciousness. It treats it as a joke or an exaggeration. At worst, we are a land of serial killers, deplorables, and poor people. And if we weren't hanging, hanging on by a raggedy thread, maybe we could take it. 
Maybe, but we are. My people feel humiliated by you. And ultimately, humiliation is the root of all terrorism. And there are some uh, serious fences to mend here, and it's going to take a lot of effort to rebuild the measure of trust. That's, that's made a lot harder by something I'll discuss later. Okay, I do want to read some of your comments and see uh, where uh, where we go from here. Uh, Jay Jackson's tuning in. Hi, Jay. History lessons with Chris. I know. Yeah, that's what these are. Uh, these are turning into Chris Tree. Oh man, that's a good hashtag, Jay. That's a good hashtag. <laughs> the ma I would. I actually. Yeah, I. I literally just had that thought right, as I stopped reading. Is the the maga dude. Uh, from our coffee shop show. Uh, so if you don't know, uh, Jay, very funny comedian, incredible singer, by the way, too. Um, he lives in in Little Rock, and we did a show at uh, Guillermo Coffee House last year. And before our show, there was this, like, like everything against his current administration was a poetry show. <laughs> and it was this lesbian, Latino, non-binary poet and she read some pretty heavy, like, anti-Trump poems. And there was a dude in a MAGA hat that sat through fucking all of it. All of it. He sat through all of it. And then he sat through our show. Jay is a black gay uh, military person. <laughs> I'm a immigrant socialist comedian. And he sat through the entire show. And the worst thing that happened was I didn't get to talk to him after the show. Because he had been in the coffee shop for what I presume is four hours. But that dude fucking sat through something that he shouldn't have enjoyed. <laughs> Tabitha. Uh, this is us. I support Amendment 2, but the crazed dingbats with guns and state capitals displaying their white privilege. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the guy just wanted us to be responsible with, with guns and not, uh, not take it away. Uh, John Sheehan. Uh, my mom used to call me every time the Big Bang Theory made a comic book reference and asked me if I was watching. And I was like, no, I'm not watching the nerd minstrel show. <laughs> yes, that show is also insulting to nerd culture. <laughs> uh, Jay, you made me think of something I have been wondering off and on for the past two weeks. How did it come to pass that these protests to reopen states under quarantine orders uh, get co-opted by Second Amendment fanatics and the alt-right movements. Yeah, I I've been uh, uh, thinking about that too, and I think I think it's just it's paranoia. It's it's the it's this kind of understanding that the government with progressive policies isn't out to make real progressive policies. They you know they're they're out to increase your tax on uh, on your on your land assets and come for your wealth and and so on and so forth. So. Then they kind of have to take these militia routes and grab their guns and go, you know, fight the government as as the militia did back in back in the old days. Um, and then, you know, the narrative gets co-opted where it's not let's sit down and talk to these people and ask them the question of like, hey, what are you afraid of? Why do you think we should reopen the states without any sort of um, real plan in place? Right. Um I've been saying this for weeks. I think herd immunity is probably the way forward, but herd immunity, just like social distancing and quarantine, without a medical treatment plan, uh, without a economic plan, is kind of doomed to fail. So whatever we do going forward has to have a plan that involves medical treatment and uh, an economic plan. And I think because there isn't one, uh, their fear is being twisted into reopen the states. I don't know what to do, and I'm scared. Uh, so I get it. I don't agree with it, but I understand where it's coming from, and it sucks because that's. I think that's a real fear that we all have. Is like, what the fuck is happening, um, and what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to move forward from this? So, yeah, and I think because they carry guns, they they get looped into all of them. Get looped into the anti-vaxxers or the the second amendment people or the alt-right people who also kind of have this like go against the government mentality <laughs> john shiam fantastic musician by the way uh does live streams every monday that you should check out uh have you ever heard about the rural purge on cbs they canceled green acres uh and other rural shows in the late 60s because of bad ratings but 
because they didn't want their brand to be associated with country folk. Uh, Green Acres is an amazing show. Check it out if you haven't seen it. I have not seen it. Um, early 70s. I will have to check that out. I'll have to add that to my list. I am working my way through Star Trek right now. Uh, and once I finish that, uh, and once uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard accepts my dad ship, uh, when he becomes my dad, I'm doing fine in the quarantine, you guys. Uh, I, I, I will have to check out some Green Acres. I've heard about this show, actually. Um, you know what's a really uh, another great show? Uh, that uh, John and, and you guys should check out. It's on Netflix. It's a show called The Ranch. Uh, the first season has a bunch of like goofy kind of sitcom-y jokes, but season two onwards, it really starts to pick up and the dramatic, um, the dramatic scenes are really, really good, you guys. Um, and, uh, you know, Ashton Kutcher does a really great job in that show. Um, uh, Sam... Shit. It's the dude with the mustache and I'm and I'm losing his name. If you remember this guy's name, he was in um uh, he was in the uh the big Lebowski. Sam Elliott, Sam Elliott, Sam Elliott, he's in it. Great, it's a really good show. It really kind of shows you um how like what conservative ranchers have to go through and how the conservative side has to deal with corporate control of land. Uh kind of like what this article is talking about. So okay, uh let's Let's keep going down this article. Are you guys good, by the way? Is is everybody okay? Uh, I know this video is running kind of long, but I kind of knew that it would, and I'm okay with it because I haven't done a um, a video in a while. So I'm kind of having fun doing this with you guys. So I hope you guys are cool with continuing reading this thing. Um, if you got to go, I totally get it. We're, we're closing in at an hour and a half, and I really appreciate you guys fucking sticking around. <laughs> You guys are, you guys are rock stars, man. <laughs> All right. So number three, uh, marketing matters. There's little to no difference between marketing and propaganda. I literally used to teach commercial propaganda to my high school students. Yes, thank you for saying this, dude. I I have a graphic design degree, and I legitimately didn't want to join. Um, like bigger graphic design firms or or apply to anything that says like marketing manager because I was like, this is all bullshit. Like when I was like 21, I like really, really hesitated to apply for jobs because I was like, this is all, this is, marketing is taking psychology and finding out what your psychological weaknesses are and then playing up to it. That's all marketing ends up being. <laughs> They're just like, what are you scared of? We'll use that. Buy our buy our soda or your children will become communists. And it's just like, whoa, shit, I don't want my kids to be, drink it, drink it, right? Like that's, that's how marketing works. <laughs> Hyperbole, I know, but that's also a marketing tool. <laughs> okay, you can say that Republicans are propaganda masters all you want. It's marketing and they're damned good at it. They are. Uh, so are the Democrats though. Say what you want about the policies. Republicans have been uh, way the hell better at selling their policies, especially to rural America. Matthew Bates isn't wrong about why they have an advantage here. I'm not sure who Matthew Bates is. I'll have to look him up later. A win for them is to do nothing. Their whole shtick is to do absolutely nothing and to do a lot less of what you're already doing. And they've sold it incredibly well whether it's catchy bits like Reagan's welfare queen or the line government is the problem. Republicans have been doing an excellent job of selling the idea that the government is not an instrument of the people for doing good for society. Yeah, they they've really fucking nailed that. And you know how they've nailed that? Uh, by making sure that their party is not an instrument for doing good for the people. <laughs> You have people like fucking Mitch McConnell that went against somebody in his own party, John McCain. I, I, he's kind of, I, he's not my favorite person, right? But John McCain did push back against Mitch McConnell when Mitch McConnell was making the argument that uh, corporate lobbyists and taking bribes should be legal for Congress. And John McCain was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And Mitch McConnell was like, I think it's a good idea. It's freedom. I think if it's free, like, if you want to see proof 
that the that the Republican Party believes that the government is not the instrument uh, of the people for doing good for society. Just look at what the Republicans believe in. And but that's dedication to the marketing. They successfully gotten a significant chunk of people to believe that the Constitution doesn't actually say in multiple places that the purpose of the government and of taxation is for the general welfare or at minimum redefined what that means to rich people going to get rich and that's the way it should be. Uh, Madison and Alexander Hamilton advocated for this shit. Alexander Hamilton several times continues to try to advocate for a fucking king. The thing that the Revolutionary War fought against, he was like, yeah, we should do that again because people are dumb. And we have a fucking musical about him that no poor person can afford to go to. Anyway, um, they've sold a philosophy that what's good for the golden goose is good for you and the rest of you regular ganders and made people think that's morally correct. This is trickle-down economics is what he's kind of describing here. Uh, they've mastered the oversimplification of complex issues for the, act, for the average person. Their actual mascot really should be uh, this guy. I'm not sure who this is. I mean, it's Matthew Broderick uh, in, a, in a thing. Does anybody know who this is? Does anybody know who Matthew Broderick is performing here? If you do leave a comment, we'll come back to it. Because I don't think I've seen this movie. Uh, they're in incredibly effective at creating a problem, selling a solution, uh, which they can conveniently offer at a discount price, profiting widely from that solution, and leaving the whole thing in shambles behind them for someone else to clean up. Okay, uh, And most of all, they're fantastic at convincing people that the alternative uh, to getting them screwed over by them is somehow worse. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, why, why do rural people eat this up? Because it seizes on something they feel pretty damn real to them. Government is constantly putting them uh, more, government is constantly putting more burdens on them and they don't feel like they're getting what they pay for. Democrats have done a bang up job of promoting mass transit and electric cars, cars and all sorts of things that they will never see. In, in the meantime, their hospitals are closing and their schools are shrinking and losing good teachers and buses uh, don't go past their place and their roads are falling to shit and their health insurance keeps going up. It sure seems like Democrats are helping the city people and not them. By the way, this exact problem exists in the rural communities in India as well, and I'm sure in virtually every country. Um, and Modi, another complicated figure, uh, as he his whole thing was trying to get rural people access to healthcare, access to electricity, access to the internet. The problem is Modi is a politician and executed plans to get rid of corruption and integrate rural people into more kind of urban um, necessities in the worst possible way because he's a politician and he fell into the trap of being a politician. Um, so if you drove uh, a Tesla out to my people, they'd laugh their asses off at you. It seems like a complete impractical car to them. It's too nice uh, to get it dirty and has way too many bells and whistles. Yes, I've met these people. Uh, and that's what they see AOC telling them to buy. Uh, liberals are goddamn horrible at marketing their policies to my people. But I have to say, um, there's there was a lot of people, including Elizabeth Warren, who came out and said that she's not trying to talk to these people. She is talking to the people that she knows is going to vote for them uh, or, or vote for her rather. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of a corporate democratic policy and it's a failing in the corporate democratic policies that they don't want to talk to the, the rural communities. Um, so I will say that, that their marketing is probably terrible because their marketing is not intended to be directed at the rural community. Um, they've kind of relegated they because they they just don't think that the rural community is even going to vote for them. So why bother? Um, and in my opinion, I think that is kind of the wrong way to go about things. If you if, if that's you know that's that's kind of my opinion on it. I think it's, it's kind of the wrong way to go about doing things. Now this is especially true in the era of Trump. Liberals is essentially uh, have been essentially running on a platform of well we're better than that shit-filled dumpster fire, right? 
Uh, this isn't good enough. You want progress, you have to sell it to them. Uh, these policies are undeniably good for a lot of people who haven't bought into them. Universal health care would absolutely be good for a lot of people who aren't currently voting Democrats or on board with some of the more liberal policies. Many of them are paying out of control premiums and deductibles and are going into medical bankruptcy. By the way, America is, is I think, the only country right now with medical bankruptcy. Um, rural hospitals are going under and cutting back essential services all of which makes it much harder on these people. A universal health insurance system uh, that could ensure that rural people can still get adequate care at a lower cost uh, than they currently pay is undeniably good for them. I constantly see liberals who just wave this away. Um, they simply refuse to market anything because they think it's obvious or only an idiot would not understand that. Again, that just plays into the pretentiousness problem. No, that's not enough. Liberals have to sell it. And yeah, they have the extra advantage that they have to play to win when all the Republicans have to do is play not to lose. Ooh, that's a good important point. Doing something is a lot harder than doing nothing. And it's easier to scare people into sticking with a shitty thing they know than a scary thing they don't. Uh, Republican policies right now are repacking their own warm piss <laughs> in unwashed bleach bottles with heavily with hastily uh, scrawled lemonade in Sharpie with a tape. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Sorry, this is a ridiculous sentence. And it's kind of hilarious. Let me restart it. Republican policies right now are repacking their own warm piss in unwashed bleach bottles with hastily scrawled lemonade in Sharpie. <laughs> on a tape, taped piece uh, of ripped off notebook paper. <laughs> Guys, that's a fucking spectacular goddamn sentence. And yeah, they have the extra advantage that they, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I will go back to reread that point. Uh, but seriously, if you can't beat that, then you've clearly, uh, in need a better uh, of a better marketing firm if you want to change that you have to sell it no no stop i can hear you complain already <laughs> oh man i know i know we, we've been reading a lot i want to read uh, one of the comments oh from jay okay uh i want to push back a little against the idea that rural people don't know that stereotypes are wrong i feel like in this day and age people ought to have a baseline understanding that there are some things uh, that are demeaning and unacceptable to say. If for no other reason, uh, then they wouldn't want their shit said about them. <laughs> yeah, you can't tell me that you have a problem with how your rural communities are portrayed negatively in the media and then um, turn around and tell jokes about running Mexicans. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that, Jay. I think that is an important... Um, it's, it's part of that hypocrisy, and uh, I think that hypocrisy might be sold to them. So th that's one thing that the minority community and the rural community probably have in common is their representation in the media. And once we find that common ground together, we can move forward to have that conversation. So I think that might be the start of the conversation uh, when you have someone in the rural community making stereotypes like running, you know, running like a Mexican with a TV set um, and, and say, hey, do you want to be portrayed as a dumb, toothless hick. And then I think start the conversation from there. You'll probably get a little bit of pushback and defensiveness, but yeah, I think I agree, man. It, it, yeah, you, you should have a baseline understanding just because you don't want the stereotypes to be levied against you anyway. That's a very good point uh, to, to bring up. That hypocrisy, I think, is, is kind of sold uh, to a lot of us in this situation. Thanks for, thanks for putting that comment up, Jay. Okay, so number four, you're bitching about conservatives not playing in good faith is a waste of time. Uh, this guy puts up some pretty good uh, pop culture quotes through here. Uh, he, he's got a Doctor Who quote up there. Uh, but I can hear the filthy liberals reading <laughs> reading this so, uh, who already just audibly sighed and got angry because they're pissed about the fact that it's a massive uphill battle. Yeah, it's a massive uphill battle. All, all progressive causes are massive uphill battles. 
Um, you're going to bitch about the electoral college and the gerrymandering and voter ID and all the ways that liberals are being deprived of a fair shake in government and conservatives not engaging in good faith. And there is a lot of that. There's a lot of blocks on both sides of the aisle, right? And, and, and the, the Green New Deal is a great example of that. When, when the first Green New Deal came out, uh, there was a lot of pushback from both the Democrats and the Republicans. Actually, going even further back, we talked about FDR earlier. The New Deal had pushback from uh, Democrats and Republicans. The Republicans, again, used their marketing machine um, and the creation of the religious right to co-opt the working class to propagandize that the New Deal was actually going to be bad for them because if corporations um, don't succeed, then they can't trickle their wealth down to their employees instead of having like protections for the employees and stuff. Uh, and two Republicans uh, crafted the Taft-Hartley bill, which, uh, which killed the unions. Uh, so, you know what wasn't fair? Decades of getting kicked in the teeth as global trade and automation and debt traps pounded rural economies based on the agriculture and manufacturing while progressive policies promised help that never came. Yeah, that kind of sucks. Uh, my people aren't going to play in good faith because they see no reason to and they have no incentive to trust liberals in their playbook. Playing dirty is getting them what they want uh, compromising never did. Uh, and that kind of sucks that that's the, that's the, that's sort of the reality of, of, of the mentality there. Uh, at least conservatives are honest about the fact that my people are on their own and can't expect meaningful assistance from the government. And to that, I say, if that's what the conservatives are saying, why are you backing up the conservatives as somebody in the rural community? somebody that used to come from a proud working class ethic somebody that says if you fall on hard times don't expect the government to help you out you're on your own that's your fault you fell on hard times on your own and conservatives still vote for politicians in the republican party that say that shit to them it's it's this very strange cognitive dissonance that i don't I, I really tried to understand and I will continue to try to understand as much of that as possible because it's it's baffling and it's and it's kind of like tragic to me because I don't want these people to to have to go through something like that. I don't want I don't want them to go through a hard time and then look upon politicians and a and a political ideology that they have trusted only for that ideology and that politician to look back at them and say, You got yourself in this mess, you get yourself out, you can go fuck yourself. That's not fucking fair at all. That's crazy. It distracts with the experience. Uh, distracts with their experience. Progressives spent decades overcompromising and underdelivering. At least when they elect Republicans, they get what they pay for. If you're going to get kicked in the ass, you might as well get lower taxes out of it. Okay, that kind of answers the kind kind of answers the question that I had. Uh, as P.J. O'Rourke once noted, the Democrats are the party that says government will make you smarter, taller, and richer and remove the crabgrass on your lawn. The Republicans are the party that says government doesn't work, uh, and then they get elected to prove it, which goes back to the earlier point that I was making. <laughs> Me and P.J. O'Rourke, man. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying uh, you need to take the low road and get in the mud at as my people say, if you wrestle with the pig in the sty, all that happens is you get dirty and the pig likes it. I'm saying you need to quit being surprised, have a plan for that, and then be better at controlling the message around it. Bernie's socialism shtick is screwing y'all over. It's the same liberal strategy that's gotten you where you are. Promise a metric to, to a shit ton that's going to be imposed on us, whether we like it or not. And then we all get to live with the catastrophic failure when it implodes. Yeah, I gotta say, um, Bernie's been a little bit of a disappointment this run. Um, I was very disappointed in his performance. I, I I like what he says. And I think after all of this, uh, some of you guys know that I'm a, I was a big Tulsi supporter and she kind of uh, shit the bed, Bernie shit the bed uh, and I kind of came to the realization of something I think I was denying for a long time, which is that people like Bernie Sanders, Tulsi Gabbard, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Donald Trump, these are all mascots for an idea. Um, and what we need to do is support the idea and, and stay true to our belief systems and support each other. 
um, talk to each other about these ideas, uh, talk to each other about, uh, you know, taking care of each other. Uh, so that is sort of really, really important in this situation. I, I look at these people as mascots. I don't look at them as the be all end all of these ideas. Um, so, uh, yeah. Mark Viola. The New Deal passed with stringent support from rural communities. There's no social security without farmers and rural folk. Yes, good point, Mark. Uh, excellent point. Um, yeah, the religious right is is really what uh, there, there was a, a, a very uh, attractive pastor. I, I did a piece about this a couple of years ago, but this guy basically got corporations involved to kill the New Deal. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you for that comment, Mark. Okay, uh, we got one more section and then we're done. Uh, thank you guys for hanging in there with me. <laughs> okay, number five. Not everything unjust is racist and not everything that's racist is intentionally racist, okay? Uh, words matter, what words we use matters. I tried to tell liberals this when they compared Mitt Romney to Hitler and Mussolini, I was told to go away. Uh, and here, here we are. My people won't listen to you anymore because everything is racist, everything is over the top, or at least so they feel. And I get that criticism. I understand that criticism from both sides. There is a ton of injustice in this country and a solid 70% of it is continued trauma and inertia from slavery and its successors. Being anything not white in this country does put you at an inherent automatic disadvantage compared to the advantage of being white. Very important thing to acknowledge. Uh, and a lot of it is trauma and inertia from slavery and the way that slavery has been transformed um, into modern labor politics. What do I mean by that? Uh, look at the way that I brought up the Taft-Hartley bill. It kills unionization. It protects corporations. Look at the way Amazon workers are treated. Look at the way Walmart employees are treated. I mean, they get pittance. Like seven, like minimum wage being seven twenty-five an hour is wage theft. Like it's the literally the bare minimum of what they can do for you to not call it slavery. Internships also are real. That's nobody's getting paid there to do work. Some of uh, some of that has to do with actual racism, and some of that has to do with disadvantages disadvantages of poverty, which largely exist because of prior actual racism. And there's a lot of catching up to do. But when everything becomes a matter of outrageous injustice, it does start to become less meaningful. When the outrage is constant, it starts to become background noise. When everything is racist, eventually nothing really is to conservatives. I have had that argument before. Um, and then it's very difficult to back paddle and say, okay, I understand that, that you're kind of listening to this cacophony, but here's the argument. And then I have to make the argument. Um, I was in Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, great fucking great town. And there is a, a venue called Wayward Kraken. And we had a really interesting conversation after the show where they asked me if I believe Donald Trump was racist. And I said, yes, uh, I believe that he is. And I believe that he's purposely racist because, uh, and he's purposely xenophobic because there's evidence uh, that he used the old Klan tactic to make sure that black people wouldn't live in his buildings in New York, uh, which is to when a black person would come in and they would fill out an application, they would mark the application so that they don't have to consider it. He also hires uh, undocumented workers. And before the job, just before it's almost done and he has to pay them, he calls immigration on them and gets them deported. These are all intentionally racist things, right? Um, and it's, it's difficult because these are the things that we have to talk about when we talk about intentional racism, not just blan blanketly saying, well, everything Donald Trump does is racist. No, there's specific things that he does are racist. And let's talk about those specific things. And let's talk about how they've affected the communities and what we can do uh, to fight, to push back and fight back against this stuff. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what conservatives need to hear. Uh, because a lot of these conservatives don't want to be associated with the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> 
uh, appropriately challenging racism and injustice is tough. It's hard to see something that is de deeply upsetting and uh, not want to just yell in rage at it. I get that. I do it a lot. It's rarely successful. I feel uh, I feel statements are ineffective. Putting a human face uh, on an injustice is very effective. That is how what you said, uh, that is how what you just said was hurtful to me can be effective. Don't try this offline. Most of the time you're dealing with trolls who don't give a shit, but in person it can be very effective. And, and for the most part, it can be. Um, when, when I used to talk to my conservative father-in-law, that's that's what I would point out. I would say, hey, here here's what you're saying is, um, you know, I understand what you're saying, but here's why what you're saying is, you know, hurtful and uh, where these communities of color that you are speaking out against are coming from. Most conservatives and most of my people aren't being racist on purpose, uh, and that's why they actually get offended when you call them that. They honestly don't know why what they said or did was racist or otherwise unjust. They just have a very, very simplified view of what that means. Yeah. Uh, it's not that they don't understand uh, things like microaggressions. Uh, they just don't have the same context for it. They understand trauma, but very differently. They understand disadvantage, but very differently. Uh, take a calm, calming breath and respond in kindness. Explain to them what was said is hurtful and why most of my people are not intentionally hurtful. They are trying. They they're not trying to be racist. They they literally don't understand why they said uh, what they said was hurtful. And that's one of the comments that Jay brought up. Right? Um, is this sort of ignorance and blindness uh, to it, and they don't understand how making a joke about a Mexican stealing a TV and rural people being called hicks and them not liking it is the same. They can't see that. <laughs> so sometimes it's like, okay, whew, here's why. And, and if you explain it, I think you'll probably end up getting um, a halfway decent response. Uh, people do switch sides if they have a good reason. So writing off my people as a lost cause. Uh, so quit writing off my people as a lost cause. Honestly, this one bothers me the most. I can't tell you how many liberals who are thoroughly convinced that every Trump supporter and every Republican is a lost cause and will never, ever change. Uh, one of your own standard bearers changing sides, Elizabeth Warren. She was a Republican and a diehard conservative not that long ago. She was 47 when she switched sides after she spent a long time dealing with bankruptcies and foreclosures as a lawyer and then uh, through having her grad assistants research that. She was convinced uh, of the Republican line before then that people failed the consumer game because they were bad at it and made bad choices <clears throat> and scammed the system. She found that people in bankruptcy were often a lot different than the irresponsible deadbeats she'd believed them to be. She eventually saw how corporate America had been trapping people into debt cycles for a long time, and that's how we got Liz Warren we see today. Which is also very confusing why she made a public statement that she wasn't going to talk to conservatives. Um, you know, it, it doesn't... Uh, um, it didn't make sense to me when she said that. I, I don't know if she was just trying to play up to the to the base or or, or what it was, but it, it it she comes from that background, so she kind of knows. If there was anybody in the race that should have been able to talk to the rural community, talk to Republican voters, and get them to understand progressive policy, it should have been Liz Warren. And I was very surprised and disappointed to hear that from her. Um, there are a lot of Obama Trump voters who voted for hope and change and then turned around and voted for Trump. Okay. Uh, and perhaps this shouldn't be entirely surprising. There were a lot of people, especially the rural voters from where I'm from, who voted for Obama, though they thought they were going, uh, who voted for Obama thought they were going to get hope and change and they got shit on with the recovery from the 2008 financial collapse. They didn't get the bailouts or the assistance. They didn't get their jobs back. They didn't see most of the recovery. Their industries, their towns all remained in Lewis, ruins. Uh, God bless David Wong over at Crack who fucking nailed it with this piece. He links a piece to the, to the thing. Uh, and it was written before Trump was elected. So that should tell you 
that it wasn't some liberal soul searching afterwards. It was a warning. Farm bankruptcies were already rising under Obama at small dairy, uh, small dairies and crop farmers went under more and more due in large part to predatory debt traps and then a freeze on credit. The CFPB helped a little, which is why you're seeing these skyrocket under Trump's the massive deregulation push. And now this is going to happen again, by the way. They're doing this again. They're waiting for people to be in these rent debts, these mortgage debts. Uh, the agricultural industry is, um, is 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 dumping their food. I mean, like they're, they're, they could just give it as a donation and get a tax write off or something. There has to be a way to to donate their their food to to food pantries and shelters uh, in in these various areas, uh, but they're not. And these farms are 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 going to end up with um, mortgage back payments of three months, which is no different than what they do when you can't pay your, your, your mortgages or anything like that. And, uh, and they're going to get screwed at the end of it. hundred percent. This is going to happen. Um, and we're, I mean, we're, we're seeing the beginnings of this. So, you know, push back against that, push back against the narrative that we don't need a, a total freeze, um, on rents and mortgages right now and support the, the strikes that are happening. To, to get that through. Because if not, then we'll see the same thing that happened in 2008. But my people felt betrayed by eight years of Obama. They saw their health insurance get more and more expensive. And all the growth in the stock market sure then seemed to help them. So when Hillary ran effectively as Obama's third term, they were willing uh, to throw their lot in with Trump, who they believed knew the secret sauce to being rich was going to somehow share it with everybody. They really thought that he was going to somehow strong arm China into uh, playing better and everything else. Many of them still do. They think they're going to get the uh, change that they were promised under Obama. And believe me, plenty of them feel just as betrayed and ready to burn the whole thing to the ground because they feel uh, just as betrayed by both sides. Some of them are sticking with Trump, even though uh, they know he's burning everything to the ground, because at least then they'll have the government off their backs. If everything's going to shit either way, might as well go for the one who is uh, going to get rid of all of those pesky regulations about why they can't drain off the backs, uh, back willows and get a few extra acres. My people are not ideologues for the most part, they don't actually care about small government conservatism or the nanny state. Uh, those are just convenient things they're repeating as stand-ins for what they really want. They really want the basics of a fair shake in life, reasonable rules that make sense, and general security. They want the Re Roosevelt Square deal. They want to be. Uh, they want to quit being punished for working hard when it does feel like some others are gaming the system. Corporations mostly. Uh, they want a path to retirement. They want to be able to try their hand at business. They want to be able to send their kids to a good school. Uh, they want to live in a safe neighborhood. They want to drive on decent roads. They want a hospital that isn't hundreds of miles away and that won't bankrupt them. All of these things, by the way, sh you should not be punished for wanting these things. And right now we have a system that does punish you for wanting these things, or it, it, it holds you hostage. Like your health insurance should not be tied to your work. So if you're a small business owner, or if you're, uh, if you're a small rural farmer, and you should not be paying astronomical fees to get health insurance. Um, you should not have to take out crazy fucking loans to send your kids to college. That should not be things that should happen. You should not have to have your retirement tied into into the the fucking stock exchange with a four hundred one k. That's all. That's all ridiculous. It's all how the oligarchy basically controls every aspect of our life, which goes back to how slavery has been transformed. Anyway, um, they want laws and regulations that are logical and not overburdensome, and most of all, something they have uh, uh, some say over. They want to put food on the table. They want basic dignity and respect. They want progressives to want, uh, they want what progressives want to give them and they'll gladly pay their taxes if they think they're actually going to sell them, uh, if they're actually going to get it. Sell them on how your policies will give them that. And seriously, you can make progressives out of lifelong 
Republicans. That was a good read. That was a good read. Um, hey, Jack, I dig the Biden look. Uh, oh, with my sunglasses? I got to wear it so that I don't blow out my friggin' eyes, Mark. Uh, Mark Viola, by the way, is uh, is the person that sent me this article. Uh, and uh, uh, I appreciate that. And I encourage you guys to do the same thing. Um, you should you should send me articles that uh, I uh, I should I should look into, and I probably will. Uh, so yeah, I I I appreciate Mark for sending me this article. But it was a very good, it was a very um, well written article. A lot of good thoughts, a lot of good arguments that were made in there. I hope you guys got something out of that. Uh, it it, it kind of validated some stuff, a lot of stuff that I've been saying for the last few years. Um, in terms of like, okay, we got to really start listening to each other here. This response uh, to Trump, who is sort of the the symptom in the face and the mascot of corporatism and uh, pop and, and right wing populism uh, and this strongman complex and this American exceptionalism that's been failing America's for a long America for a long time. Uh, why did this happen? Why did people think that this was the right solution? Let's talk to people. And I got shit on a lot for saying that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I feel like that might be the path forward in talking to Republicans, because when I've talked to Republicans that have come out to see my shows, when I've talked to conservatives who have come out to see my shows, um, they kind of look at me and kind of do the same thing, right? They're just kind of like, yeah, I never thought about it that way. And that's kind of a cool thing to hear, in all honesty, is... Um, that that they were like, yeah, I didn't. I never really thought about it that way. You you changed the way that I looked at something, and then when I sit down and talk to them, I go, oh, I never thought about it the way you're presenting it. That's really cool, man. Like you made me think a little bit differently about certain issues, um, you know. And I, I got I got to say, like Jay Jackson does this a lot. Whenever we talk, is we'll have we'll have these similarities, and then Jay will just take a a you know. 10 degrees over to the left and I'll go, Oh, I never really thought about it that way. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up and adding that to my perspective, because I don't think I would have had that perspective had you not brought it up. And I think these conversations are very important to have um, rather than yelling and screaming at each other. Um, I, I believe in talking about ideas. That's sort of the thing that I think I'm, I'm trying to move forward with. So uh, let's talk about these ideas. Let's talk about why they work, why they don't, why why you feel abandoned by them, and what's what's going on with you. Uh, I think that's let let's add some let's add some humanity to to the policies and the thoughts and ideas that we believe in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my throat is very dry. And uh, my my jar is out of water and I'm going to need to get more water and probably rest my voice for the rest of the goddamn day. Uh, but uh, I, I appreciate you guys watching and hanging out and tuning in for the longest fucking live stream that I've done uh, since the start <laughs> of this quarantine. I hope you guys enjoyed this little reading thing that we did. I might try to do it a couple more times this week. So uh, if you can do me a huge favor. Uh, a lot, a lot of you guys have hit the like button. Um, I'm sure a few guys, a few of you have, uh, uh, shared the, 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 the video and such. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please share this out. Uh, please uh, hit the like button. If you have the ability to, um, you can donate or become a sustaining member, uh, sustaining members get a free ticket to those zoom comedy shows that I'm doing the citizen revolution comedy shows ticket link, uh, in the, in the description. Uh, it's only five bucks, but if you're having a particularly difficult time and you still want to see it, please message me, uh, email me, whatever. I'll hit you up with a code. Make sure that you can come see the show. Uh, May 8th, May 22nd. And then I'll be doing them consecutively Friday nights at 9 p.m. Uh, I'm doing it a little bit later so that if uh, if you got kids or if you got some things that you're trying to do, uh, you can go do those things. You can put the kids to bed, come hang out for an hour plus, uh, and, uh, and have a good time. Um, so yeah, those are, uh, those are basically all the announcements. Thanks Jay. I'm really glad you, you tuned in and hung out, man. Uh, you, you always bring a, 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 a fun, fresh perspective and it's I, I fucking love talking to Jay Jackson. Check out Jay Jackson stuff. You guys, 
Uh, if you haven't, uh, he's he's got uh, music albums. He's a fantastic comedian. Uh, and uh, yeah, support support what Jay does. Uh, Jay does happy hours um, once a week. Anyway, uh, check out Jay's stuff. Jay, leave a link. You should put links to your things in the comment section. Uh, Mark, if you're still watching, put links to your thing in the comment section. Mark has a YouTube channel uh, where he talks about touring and has uh, great hilarious sketches. Uh, so put your links down there, you guys. And uh, I encourage people to, to support what they do. But uh, yeah, share, like, subscribe. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, till tomorrow, we'll see you in the road. I got to go be quiet for a while.